are we doing tonight? Are we doing well? Yes. Wow. Hey, that was pretty good. That was pretty good. Hey, if we've never had the chance to meet, my name is Hunter, and I get this awesome opportunity just for a few moments to walk us through some scripture. Um, We've been in this series called Rekindle, kind of walking through some of the revivals that have happened in America. And the last, this is our last week of the series. Who's enjoyed this series so far? All right, awesome, awesome. I'm so glad. Um, if, if, you, if you track all the revivals back down to the very last one that we've seen, it's this one called the Jesus Movement. And there's so much in the Jesus Movement that was crazy. I don't have even enough time to talk about it. But thankfully, they just made a movie about it. So it does the job for me. So if you want to, go to Harkins later on tonight. Or maybe, I don't know if they have a showing. But go see it sometime. It's called The Jesus Revolution. I've heard it's incredible. And I don't know about you, but I think God is really doing something. If you look at what happened 50 years ago around the Jesus Revolution and the Jesus Movement, there was this place called Asbury that kind of caught on fire. And if you haven't checked in the last few weeks, Asbury is doing the same thing. And there's places all over the country that are having these little revival moments, and they're sparking things around our nation. And I don't know about you, but I talked to my grandma, and she said that God is on his way. So um, she's never wrong. Um, I don't really want to talk anymore about that. But... What I want to do is before I dive into anything uh, tonight, I just want us to pause and I just want us to reflect really on the moment that you're in right now. I don't know what you walked in here with, but you're here. And I don't know why you're here, but God does. And tonight, I think what we're going to walk through is something that we don't get to talk to a lot or talk about a lot, but I really believe that God has a word for me and for you. So let's take a moment and pray, and then let's join tonight. Lord, we love you, and I ask that you would just be with us, God. Lord, we're just so thankful for this moment. You brought us all here for a reason, and God, I ask that you would just point out anything in us that we need to refine. God, would you lead us down a path that leads to life, and would you just bring us closer to you tonight? Would we learn how to be more like you? God, we love you, and we thank you. Amen. Do you remember what it was like to be a kid? Do do, do you remember what it was like to be sit in like your kindergarten class? How how many of you had like a favorite teacher? Favorite teacher, okay. How many of you had a least favorite teacher? Yeah, more more hands threw up. How many of you had that teacher who would let you do whatever you wanted? Yeah, yeah, those are the best teachers. I think, I think what's so fun about being a kid is, is there's a lot of benefits to it. You can get away with some stuff because you were cuter when you were younger. And there were so many things you could do. And you could, your parents would just be like, oh, man, you're just so cute. But the crazy part about it is now I, I'm 24. I got a job. I got to pay bills. I have a mortgage payment. I'm like, I didn't have that as a kid. Like, I, but dang, I wish I could do, go back to that time. Like, I don't know what your parents did, but if I did something right or if I did something good when I was little, I just got like an otter pop and everything was incredible. I don't know your situation, but that was mine. But I think sometimes as kids, we have these awesome benefit at moments. But I think there's also a part of us as we're a kid that starts to grow that's just not the best. When you combine a child's very curious mind with a child's very stubborn heart... (laughs) You get something that's not very great. Um, Any of you guys have a cookie jar in your house and your parents wouldn't let you get into the cookie jar and then you did get into the cookie jar and you broke the cookie jar and they're like, why'd you reach for the cookie jar? And it was because I wanted a cookie out of the cookie jar. Everyone had one of those moments. Well, for me, I I had a moment and I think it all culminates to this point where like we were the worst version of ourselves in middle school. Does anyone else feel that way? Or maybe it was your best moment. Um, I'm sorry for those of you who it was. But for me, I think my worst moment was when I was in middle school or the the moment of that. I got this thing called a phone, and on this phone was this app called Facebook. And I was 14, and Facebook at the time was pretty lit. I don't know if you guys had Facebook back then, but it was like the thing. Before Instagram, before Twitter, it was dope. Um... I don't, have, have any of you ever looked back at what you posted when you were, I want to show you some of the things that I posted when I was a kid. So, um, so let, let, let's see him. So 99 on my math final, day made. I think I posted that because that only happened one time. So let's see the next one. Well, that game was pointless. 
Um, and then for some reason I said, I have the greatest mom in the whole world. And I had to capitalize the G. Um, I, have a, I have one more, I have two more I think. That was my profile picture. Um, so 13 year old Hunter uh, was a stud to say the least. Um, you can probably still find my SoundCloud with that photo. Um, there's a whole Mickey hat in the background. I don't want to get into my Disney adultness, but we'll keep going. Getting prank called in the middle of the night is not cool, people. Not cool. That one I was 15, which I'm a little less proud of. But um, it's so funny to look back at these. Why do I even show you these? This, these are just some fun things. But um, Facebook actually had a uh, pretty big impactful moment in my life. And that sounds like the dumbest statement I've ever said. But I really did have a, a moment that I wasn't super proud of. Um, on Facebook, you had friends, and there was this point where I started to figure out that I could have friends on there that I didn't even know. You could post anything you wanted to. You could have any friends that you wanted to. My parents, being the good parents they were, always told me, hey, you know, be careful, like, who you talk to on here. Not everyone on here might be the best person to talk to, and you might see some accounts that you shouldn't look at, and just, just, just be careful. We trust you, though. Uh, okay. But then I was 14, right? So like when I see these accounts pop up and it's like add friend, I'm like, all right, cool. He plays in the NBA, add, and it was like a fan account. Um, but there was this one day where I was just scrolling on Facebook like every 14-year-old does, and I found this profile. And it was from a girl who went to the public school. I'd never seen her before, but her profile picture was a picture I've never seen anyone pose that way or wear those kind of clothes. And I think you know what I'm talking about. And I was like, whoa, <laughs> what in the world's going on? My 14-year-old self clicked on the profile. And I started to look, and I started to just be like, okay, I've never really, like, seen this before. I went to a very small Christian school. Um, actually, I actually have a friend in here named Bren who went to the same school. Um, we graduated with 44 people in Oklahoma, so you can imagine how that was. But um, it was great. But as I was scrolling through, I'd never seen these kinds of pictures. They were very inappropriate wearing these really no clothes. And I did something that I would regret. And I liked one. And then I went down more and I liked more. But then I left my room and I was just like, okay, I think I'm fine. I, I went to the dinner table and sat down and had dinner with my family. And then after dinner, my mom, she's like, Hunter, do you have anything to tell us? I was like, no, mom. She's like, are you sure? She's like, no, mom. Why would I need to talk to you right now? She's like, are, are you sure? No. She pulls out her phone. She starts to scroll. And she stops. And she holds out the phone to me and shows me. It's this caption title that says, Hunter Perry liked this photo. And I was like, What? I was 14, I didn't know the intricacies of technology. I didn't know that if I liked something that the whole world was gonna see it. And then everyone found my memes that I liked and that was even worse, not really. Um, but I, <laughs> I just remember being in this moment, my mom showed me this and I was like, uh, what do I do? And so she scrolled and for like f four photos, it said Hunter Perry liked this photo. The summer before, I had decided that I was going to go into ministry at summer camp, and then I wanted to be a pastor, and I wanted to go down this track, and my mom had always told me, like, like now you have to really watch your decisions, and your decisions are really going to come across, and you got to be really careful, especially when you put yourself on these kind of platforms and watch out, but I had this moment, and I was like, no, what did I do? And sometimes when you're kind of caught in the middle of something, you're usually like really defensive about it or you're apologetic. 14-year-old Hunter just bawled. <laughs> I was like gone. I was like, no, what just happened to me? I was a pretty good kid for the most part, but this wrecked me. I was like, what do I do? Everyone sees this. My whole future is gone. It wasn't like Snapchat where it just goes away. <laughs> I was like, what do I do? But what my parents did in that moment is really what we're gonna kinda see tonight. My mom and dad said, hey, you did something that was wrong, but we're gonna help you fix it. So they sat me down, I pulled my phone out, 
I went to my profile, and they helped me unlike all the pictures that I had liked. And then they took my phone, <laughs> they took Facebook off, and I lost it for a little bit. And you might be like, oh, that's kind of cruel. Well, it wasn't. Because what I gained out of that moment was the understanding that when I am in my moment of being caught, the best thing I can do is just say, I'm sorry, I'm going to do better, and I'm actually going to choose something different next time. What we're going to find tonight, as we look in the story of this guy named Joel, is that when you're caught in a moment, when someone's, fa when someone's found you out, when you've done something wrong, the choice that you make there not just it affects a friendship, but can actually affect your entire future. So if you have your Bibles, open up to Joel chapter 1. The, the big idea that we're going to find tonight is that repentance is the spark of revival. We've looked at prayer, we've looked at scripture, we've looked at the Holy Spirit, we've looked at a lot of different things in this series, but I will tell you this. You can pray, you can read the Bible, you can even... Ha want the Holy Spirit, but if you have not repented, nothing will change. Repentance is the spark of revival. And this guy named Joel, as you're flipping there, he, he, he's, he's really cool. The, the book of Joel, if you're having trouble finding it, it's in the Old Testament. It's in between the books of Hosea and Amos. But Joel's really interesting. There's not a whole lot we know about him except for this book. But all prophets were given a, a message to then give to the people, and Joel's was not a really easy task. His main task was to communicate that the day of the Lord is on its way. And the day of the Lord was this moment where God was going to come, and he was going to either deliver you, or he was going to destroy you. It was this day that depending on your current circumstances, he was either going to save you, or he was going to subdue you. Sadly, the people of Israel were not in the best place. So Joel's message to them doesn't ring very exciting. See, what had happened to the people of Israel, they had rebelled for so long that God had actually sent these locusts to them. They had no crops. All of them had died. In verse 4 of chapter 1, it says, After the cutting locusts finished eating the crops, the swarming locusts took what was left. After them came the hopping locusts, and then the stripping locusts too. I don't know why there's four different kinds of locusts. I really don't want to know about the last one. But I'm just seeing maybe this is a big deal that all the locusts took all of their food. And just when you think it couldn't get worse, they've already lost all their crops. Most of their animals are hurting. If you read the rest of chapter 1 of Joel, you see that their animals are sick. They don't have anything to live off of. In chapter 2, Joel announces that the day of the Lord is coming. And if you're an Israelite, you're just like, no, I can't even eat. What am I supposed to do to prepare for this? But Joel starts to talk about what this is going to look like. And he talks about these, he uses the, the famine that is going on as a metaphor. And he says that this army is going to come, and it's gonna, they're going to look like locusts, but then they're actually going to transform into looking like horses. These horses are going to be caught on fire. They're going to jump on mountains. They're going to destroy everything behind them. Then they're going to look like soldiers. Those soldiers are going to get in the town. They're going to get in through your windows. They're going to get everywhere. You can't stop them. Everywhere they go, they're just going to leave a trail of burn, and then where they're going to burn. That's it. And then in verse 11, he says this, the Lord is at the head of the column. So they have no crops. Their animals are sick. And now the Lord is leading an army against them. And we think our situations are pretty bad. <laughs> why, in the Lord, why in the world would the Lord be at the head of this army? God really doesn't do anything without a reason. See, we can feel, feel really bad for the people of Israel, but they have had multiple chances to do exactly what God has told them. Read the Old Testament. Track through from Abraham all the way down to the rest of his people to this moment, and you'll see that Israel has had a lot of chances to do what God has said. But they chose not to. Here's the thing. If you continue to do the things that God has told you not to do, you should not be surprised when you end up in places that you never wanted to be. They might have been freaking out, but they were only getting what they had wanted. 
If you do the things that you know you're not supposed to do, you're going to end up in places you never wanted to be. So you see, the Lord is at the head of the column. It continues and it says, he leads them with a shout. This is his mighty army and they follow his orders. The day of the Lord is an awesome, terrible thing. Who can possibly survive? I can imagine myself if I'm standing on this like castle, this is way back when, and I see the army of God coming. I have no food, I have nothing to support myself with. If I see this coming, I'm like, yeah, I'm out. I'm done, all right? I'm just gonna, I'm taking out my armor, throwing out my weapons, and I'm just, what do you want me to do, you know? There's no way you can beat it. There's no way. But I think taking this a step farther, this isn't just a problem that the Israelites find themselves in. This is a problem that we actually find ourselves in. The cool thing about the Bible is the Bible has a lot of stories in it. But if you can take a perspective onto the Bible that will help you out, the Bible isn't just a book about what happens. The Bible is usually a book about what always happens. We find ourselves in these shoes really easily. The Israelites had acted like children, a lot like how we acted like children. There's some benefits of being the people of God. But when you don't do the right thing, there are some things that you're going to struggle with. There are some moments where you are going to have to get back on track. So this army's coming. What does God tell them to do? There's got to be some kind of redemptive out of this. In verse 12, he says this. That is why the Lord says, turn to me now while there is time. Give me your hearts. Come with fasting, weeping, and mourning. Don't tear your clothing in grief, but tear your hearts instead. Return to the Lord your God, for he is merciful and compassionate, slow to get angry, and filled with unfailing love. He is eager to relent and not punish. The Lord is so interesting. He is so interesting. In one moment, he can be leading an army and the next he can be your father. To me, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And I can almost imagine God in this moment just being like, I don't wanna do this. Like, I'm your father first. I don't wanna do this. But I think we can find ourselves on that side of the line really easy whether we have given our life to Jesus or whether we have not. If you haven't, you are on that side. That is the reality. There is this army coming and it's going to happen. The day of the Lord is gonna happen and you are in this kingdom that will not stand. But for those of us who are saved, I think we find ourselves there frequently. I was someone, I think, who had a perpetual hard time with pride. I really like my ideas, and I really think that they're good. But do you know where that gets you? Into some really big pitfalls with people. And I've had to do a lot of work to try and fix my like perpetual natural pride. But in those moments where I pitch an idea, let's say at a meeting and someone goes against it, my first act is to be very defensive. (laughs) And then if, no one sides with it, I get really upset. And then I just keep going more and more and more, and I get to this place of bitterness. You know what I've actually done? It's not just an emotional thing. What I've actually done is I've gone from this side of the line in this repentant war, and I've put on this armor that I've dropped. So I'm like, ah, come on. I pick up my old weapons, and I stand, and now I've clothed myself with the exact same things that God has told me not to clothe myself with. I have actually chosen to get on the other side. But what God is calling us to do is to return. So what I want us to do now in this time is whether you're there by choice or whether you're there by not knowing or whether you're there by, I don't know how to get out. What I want us to do is I want you to see God's recipe for repentance. In this story, there is hope. In this story, there is always hope. So God's recipe for repentance is this. The first thing we find is in this word, return. The first thing that we see is that we need to realize your need for God. This word return means to see and then to turn around. It's this moment where God says, return to me. 
What he's saying is I need you to see and I need you to turn around. What do we need to see? In our very nature, when we were born, before you had done nothing, we were born sinful. There was nothing you could do to change that. That's what happened when Adam and Eve sinned. We are born with a sinful nature. So there's something about us in our identity that needs to be saved. But then we are very stupid, and we add on top of that other sins that we need to be saved from. What then happens is we have to see that. What God tells the people of Israel is, I need you to return to me. And what they would have heard is God saying, I need you to see that what you are doing is wrong. I need you to see that with the actions and the decisions that you are choosing are hurting yourself and they're hurting others. Actions that are not coming from the direct word of God will always hurt you and they will always hurt someone else. And it might not look like it from a close end, but it always will. Those moments that you find yourself alone at night, looking at things that maybe you shouldn't, thinking, ah, oh, this is only affecting me. It's not. Those decisions that you make with your boyfriend or girlfriend before God says that you should, don't just affect you in that moment. It affects someone else later. Every decision that you make, if it is not under the will and authority of God, will come back and bite you. So what do you do when you're caught in that situation? Well, God says what to do is you realize your need for God. That's why in verse 12 he says, that is why the Lord says, turn to me now while there is still time. What I think we fail to realize is that we actually have more of a natural locust infestation inside of us than we do a spiritual infestation. Our natural bias is to internalize emotions and internalize feelings that make us feel great, make us feel good, but then why do they disappear? Well, it's because they're eaten up. Nothing can satisfy them. You look at the people of Israel, they had no crops, they had nothing. Even if they were to grow something, it would be eaten. Why? Because what they were choosing was destroying them. Inside of you, if you don't have the spirit, nothing that you think is going to satisfy you will satisfy you because you don't have the actual capacity for that. You can only have it with the spirit. So we need to realize that there is something wrong with us and that we need to change. The second thing that we need to do is to rip your heart. This is such a very, very weird way of saying this, but I, I think it helps. In verse 13, it says, don't tear your clothing in your grief, but tear your hearts instead. In, in Israelite culture, when someone was in deep agony or pain, and this is practiced in other, other cultures too, but I think it's still practiced in other cultures, when you're experiencing this deep sense of sorrow, what they would do is they would take their clothes and they would just rip them. In this public display of, I am hurting. There's nothing else I can do but then to show you I'm hurting. Like, be with me. That's why Jesus says we need to mourn with those who mourn because people who show it, they need you. That's a whole different sermon. But they tear their clothes and they just be like, Lord, help me, Lord, help me, someone help me. But what God says is don't tear your clothes. He says tear your heart. I wonder how many of us in this room, saved and unsaved, I'm mostly talking to people who would call Jesus their savior. Have you really ever gotten to a point where your sin made you tear your heart? Where you felt such agony about the things that you were doing that hurt the heart of God, that you felt absolute sorrow. I really think I can only have felt that one time. The moment that I went outside of marriage and had sex was the real only moment that I was like, oh my God, what did I just do? this deep sense of what in the world am I doing? 
this hurtful place of I've put myself here. Why did I do that? God, I could have made all these different choices, but I put myself here. God, I've been trying to live the right way, or I thought what I was doing was good. Now I'm here. Now I'm just sad, and I don't have anybody. I found myself. I don't have the right job. I don't have a family. I'm just like, what am I doing? Have you ever found yourself there? Because I have. And it hurts. I wonder what more so. God just wants us to be really, really honest and open with the ways that we sin. You realize he sees everything. You can't hide anything from him. God wants us to see the things that we are doing that are wrong. And he doesn't want us to just see them. He wants us to let them tear us apart so that he can mend our heart. What would it look like for you to really ask God, God, where are the areas that I need to tear my heart? Where are the areas in my life that I don't know if I've been doing everything that you want me to do, but where are the areas where I need to tear my heart? And I need to get so low to the ground, and I'm just like, God, what am I supposed to do? If you can live your life without the direction of God, I don't really know how good of a life that is. It might be a successful one in this world, but you don't get to take anything with you. What does it look like to rip your heart? It's getting low. And it's coming near to the throne of God, saying, God, would you heal me? Would you help me out in areas that I don't know what to do? You need to realize your need for God, and then you need to rip your heart. The third thing that God asks us to do in this passage is to return to him to return to God. And this is the part where I think we can get right a lot of the other areas. We can get right the other two areas. We can see, if we're, if we're in community and we have people, they can be like, hey man, I don't really know um, if what you're doing is right. And you can be like, yeah man, sorry, I'm an anti-gram and I just get kind of angry sometimes. Um, and you be like, that's just me. But then you get to the point where it's just like, yeah, but you might need to change. You're like, okay, well, I'll pray about it. And you're just like, hey God, would you help me not be as angry even though they deserved it? Yeah, thank you. And then you move on, but then you get to the point of like, well, when does that change? So you return it when this was written, meant to see and then to turn around. Returning to God looks a lot more like a U-turn than it does sideways. When we say repentance, when we talk about this, it's a moment where you say, God, my sin will never get make me right. God, I need you to make me right. Because of the sin I have done, I want you to make me right. But it looks more like a U-turn. If, you, if you're driving and you're trying to go to a destination and you miss your turn, but it's right behind you, what do you have to do? You have to U-turn. Or maybe you didn't miss your turn, but the destination's on the left side and it's on the, you know, like I can't just kind of go over the median because I don't have a truck. I've got a Chevy Malibu and i got a U-turn. So then you're at this moment and you're like, okay, I'm just going to follow the directions. And in Arizona, it's really cool. You can do it before the light turns green. Um, I've heard that. Is that legal? All right, cool. Um, I'm from Oklahoma. I don't really know the driving rules out here yet, but I've heard that, and I heard it from an unlikely source, so I wanted to check and make sure. But you can U-turn, and you can get to your destination. The thing about repentance that a lot of people like to talk about is the army, that there's an army coming, that there is a thing called hell. It's real, and if you don't repent, you're going to hell. That is a reality. That is true. But there's also a part of it where if you repent, you're not just going to hell. You're going to heaven. Repentance is this awesome moment where you get to make a U-turn. Where this moment where you actually get to put all your choices that you've made and you get to put them on a cross. And they no longer define you, but you get to turn around. The thing about U-turns is it's always taking you to your destination. People usually never U-turn unless they've missed their turn or unless they're going that way. The destination that God wants you to find your home in is Him. He wants you to find your home in him. In verse 25, it says this. If you were to do these things, if you were to do these things, you were to realize your need for him, you were to rip your heart open, and you were to return to God, this is what God would do for you. The Lord says, I will give you back what you lost. To the swarming locust, the hopping locust, the stripping locust, and the cutting locust, it was I who sent the great destroying army 
against you. So God is not the enemy of trying to live life. God is actually the creator of life. When you U-turn and you are going to this destination, he's actually giving you everything you need to live the best life possible. We always think like God is just the ruiner of fun. Do you know that guidelines and boundaries actually make things better? And if God is telling you a way to live and he created you, and the lungs that are working right now and the oxygen that is in your body right now, you cannot produce that. But for some reason it's working. For some reason you're sitting here and it's so that you might get to that destination and look and be like, I know why I'm alive. And the choices that you can have in that moment where you go from this is where I was to now this is how I can live are different than anything you can experience outside of the Lord and his spirit. But if you find it, my friends, there's nothing better. So how do we get it? If you realize your need for God and you have this moment where you rip your heart, you return to him, what does that look like? If he says he'll give you back, and he'll give you back more, actually in the passage it says he'll actually give you more, a good father will provide for his children. In verse 28, it says, Then after doing all these things, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will see visions. In those days I will pour out my spirit, even on servants, men and women alike. And I will cause wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun will become dark and the moon will turn blood red before that great and terrible day of the Lord arrives. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For some on Mount Zion in Jerusalem will escape, just as the Lord has said. These will be among the survivors whom the Lord has called. Repentance is always from something, but it's always to something. After Jesus had died, and risen. He spent a little bit of time with his disciples, about a month and a half. And Jesus got to pour some of his last teaching into him, and I wish there was more scripture about what those hangs were like. I can only imagine, but he was able to spend about a month and a half with them. And then there was this moment where he took his disciples up on this mountain, and he, he told them, like, I'm going to be with you always. He told him earlier that you can do even greater things that I can do. And then he has this incredible moment with them where he's charging them. He's sending them out. He says, I'm going to be with you always. And then he leaves. (laughs) And the awesome part about it is they stand there and they're just like, because he like ascends to heaven and that's like really cool and I don't know what that looks like. But they're just like, (laughs) this is dope. (laughs) Could you imagine how awkward this would be? It's like, oh, all right. They stand up looking so long, God sends angels to be like, what are you doing? (laughs) You guys are so whack. Like, just actually go and do what you're supposed to do. And so they do it, right? They go out and they start doing all these incredible miracles and things. And it's really cool and you can read about it. But actually, the first thing they do is they actually go and sit in a room (laughs) for a while. Because they're nervous. They go to this upper room in Jerusalem and they just wait. Because imagine what it would be like to be for Peter. One of his best friends just left. His teacher, the person who's provider. I think about Peter and I think of the guy who was a fisherman and how he used to have to provide for himself. He used to have to go out and fish and catch fish and bring them back and cut them up and sell them and get income but also eat them. And then Jesus one day said, I'm going to make you fishers of men. And then so he's like, okay, cool. And then he's at this moment where Jesus actually says, bring me your lunch, bro. And he brings his lunch here. He divides it out. And now Peter's not the one that has to bring in the food. He's the one who gets to pass out the food. But he didn't have to do it. And I just imagine someone like Peter who walks through all these moments who, who I feel like I'm a lot like him because I'm really stubborn and prideful. He gets in this moment where he loves Jesus so much that he doesn't want anything to happen to him that he tries to cut this dude's head off and he's so bad at it because he's a fisherman and he just does this, not this, and he cuts a dude's ear off. I can only imagine Peter being in this moment looking up and he's like, my friend is gone. How am I supposed to do bigger and better things than him? So he sits in this upper room 
But then something happens. On this day called Pentecost, all these disciples are in this upper room. And in a moment, this mighty rushing wind from heaven comes down and fills the entire room. And then tongues of fire come down and rest on all the disciples, all the women, all the men in the room. And they start going ballistic. They start going nuts. And they're like, finally, we can leave the room. We were told the spirit was coming. So they leave. And everyone starts to hear them. These devout Jews are like, what the heck is going on? There was Pentecost. So they were having meals. They were all there in Jerusalem. So we're like, what in the world? I hear this guy speaking my language. They're like, I I hear this guy speaking my language. So everyone comes to where the disciples are, and it's so wild and crazy that someone's like, they're drunk. And Peter's like, nah, bro, it's nine in the morning. We're not day drinkers. (laughs) He's like, we go to Galilean brothers later at night. Then Peter says something very interesting. I don't have it on the screen. He says, we're not drunk, it's only 9 a.m., but I'll tell you what is happening. The prophet Joel said this was going to happen. What I wanted to do tonight is I wanted to teach about the last revival that happened in America by talking about the first revival that happened in Scripture. Seems to be a good way to talk about it, but what happened is God took me another way, but ended up doing the same thing. Peter teaches the passage in the Scripture of Joel and says the same thing that we just read, that God is going to rain down his spirit on men and women, old and young. All of this is going to happen, and guess what? That day is today. And it's an amazing thing that happens, and then he goes and he explains that, no, 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 David's not the cool one. David's not the cool one. David's dead. You can go check out his grave. Jesus is not. Jesus has risen. Put your faith in him. Put your hope in him. And pretty much what Peter's message was is like, hey, Jesus died. Jesus rose again. You kind of put him there. Say you're sorry. It's really simple. And, but when we get down to the bare bones of it, we have to ask ourselves, have we gotten there? Because who was the audience? I've never heard this talked about. The audience for Peter was devout Jews. Devout Jews would have been people who went to church. Devout Jews would have been the people that knew all the Bible verses. People that would have been able to Bible thump you way harder than you could Bible thump them. That knew all the songs. That knew how to do church. But guess what? They were missing something. Because Jesus rose, and because a new power had come down, they were missing something. And that thing they were missing was the Spirit. You want to know how you live the life that you've always wanted? The Spirit. The Holy Spirit that came down as a gift to you. How do you get it? Well, let's see what the guys asked. In in, in, in verse 37, Peter's words pierced their heart. And they said to him and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Remember that moment I told you that When you're caught in something, the choice that you make there can affect a relationship or your future. That's this moment. Peter responds, each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you, to your children and to those far away, all who have been called by the Lord our God. Then Peter continued preaching for a long time, as most of us do, Strongly urging all his listeners, save yourself from this crooked generation. Those who believed what Peter had said were baptized and added to the church that day. It's different. This was a different church. This was a different kingdom. About 3,000 in all. The first revival. Peter preached for a long time, strongly urging all his listeners, save yourself from this crooked generation. We're living in a crooked generation. Do you realize that we are living in the most Bible illiterate culture that we've ever seen? People don't know this truth. People don't know our Jesus. 
There are people at your workplaces, at your schools, maybe in your homes, in the places that you eat, that don't know this. Even more so, we live in a generation that when I have kids, I don't want them to experience the world that I experience. I don't know about you, but when I look outside these doors, it's not sunshine and rainbows. It's not easy. It's hard. Every day I see a news headline where I'm like, why did we decide to do that? Why in the world is this person doing this? Our world is getting more corrupt and more corrupt and more broken and more hurt. Do you know what this world needs? It needs Jesus. Do you know what Jesus wants to do? Do you know how I think Jesus is gonna move and fix this broken generation, this crooked generation? You know how I think he's gonna do it? I wanna ask you a question. If someone asks you, what is Jesus doing? I want you to be able to answer with what you're doing. Because he's living through you in a way where he is living your life. He has gifted you in a way where he, in, he knit you in your mother's womb. And he put gifts and talents in you that only you have. In this generation, this culture, they need you. They don't need more of me. They don't need more of Daniel. They need you. God has gifted you. He has a purpose for you. But my friends, we will never get to see the beautiful day of revival if repentance doesn't start in this room. I wonder what it, what, what does God need from this young adult ministry? What does God need out of this world to start the next revival? I honestly think he just wants some of you to really repent and really live your life for him. When you walk in these doors, don't just see your friends. See the person sitting by themselves. When you're, in your when you're walking on the street or in your workplace, are you looking and trying to live like Jesus? Are you trying to bring him to your workplace? Because my friends, the army is coming. What are you gonna do with your time? Why not live the time allotted to you in a way that makes your heavenly father proud? Because you might look weird, but that's okay. Because all the gifts any earthly man or woman can give you will all pass away, but every gift that your heavenly father gives you, you will get to have forever. So what I want us to do in this moment is I want us to think, God, where do I need to see what I'm doing is wrong? And then God, where, where do you want me to rip apart my heart and get so down into this that I need to say, God, I need your help. And then how do you turn back to him? The cool thing about return is that you owned it at some point, and that you possessed it. God just wants his children to come back home. Brothers and sisters in this place, I speak to you as a brother who struggles with this a lot. But our Father loves you. And every time you walk back in that door, he is so excited to see you. So tonight, what I want us to do is we're gonna sing a song we're gonna sing this is our God again to remind ourselves of who he is. And then we're gonna do baptisms. We are going to practically walk through what does it look like to repent in my life? We already have some people signed up and I believe that God is stirring something in someone in this room that they're gonna follow. 
But what I want to do is I just want to take time to pray. And I don't know what it looks like for you, what you kind of came into this room with, but I want you to sit there and think, God, how do I need to repent? Because if I want revival to happen, I know I need to repent. So what I want you to do is I want you to pray something like this in your own words if you want to pray it. It's just like, Jesus, I, I know my life doesn't measure up. And I know I fall short. Jesus, my life and the choices I have made could never satisfy the full cravings of my heart. Jesus, I need you to save me. Please forgive me. Jesus, I know you died for me and rose again. And I want you to come and fill my life. Spirit, would you take up every part of my life and help me live for you? God, would you have your way in this place over these people? I I come before you tonight on behalf of my friends and my brothers and sisters. Lord, stir something up in their hearts that brings revival. Lord, let them be repentive. Let them live for something greater than themselves and change this culture and this generation around us that needs them. Them the individual person that you created in their mother's womb. God, you made them intricately and you want to use them intricately. God, we love you. And Lord, I declare over all these people in here that you are going to move in their life in a way if they repent. God, would you do it? Would you prove you right? God, would you show off in ways that only you can? God, would you show us a new way? God, would you bring streams of water into dry lands, God? Would you please move, would you rend our hearts, and would you bring us closer to your throne? God, we love you, and we thank you. Amen.